Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for this morning's webinar on international student immigration documents. And with us today is Kooba Carter, an international student advisor from the International Student Center here at Dalhousie University. And she'll be answering your questions about how to get a student visa. All right, so good morning, everybody. Um, I'm so happy that you're going to be coming to Dalhousie University. So grateful that you're going to be adding to our international student body. Um, we are now almost 20% of the student population, so we will be in good company. And I want to say thanks to the Faculty of Graduate Studies for inviting me here on behalf of the International Center to help advise our new international students. So as we go into the session, I'm going to talk about visas. I'm going to talk about study permits. Um, I'm going to be talking about the general process, give you tips on how to improve your application. If you've already applied, I'm going to be telling you about what to expect. I'm going to ask that you let us know, of course, if you can hear us. If there are any audio problems, please let us know in your comments. Also, I'm sorry, it's actually the Q&A box or any comments enabled for this one. All right, so in the Q&A box, um, please let us know. And of course, there will be definitely time to ask questions and Jasmine will definitely be directing that. So there will be plenty of time if you have questions for you to give that kind of feedback. So if I'm talking and something comes up and you have a question, just file it in the back of your mind so that after the presentation is over, we will be able to address it. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to get into the presentation, and so let's get this started. So to be an international student in Canada, you require a study permit. A study permit is the legal document that allows a foreign resident to live in Canada and attend university. So in order to apply for this study permit, you need to contact a, Can a Canadian consulate or high commission, or you can refer to the Immigration, Refugee and Citizenship Canada website for instructions on how to apply and how long it takes to apply for a study permit. Now, I know some of you may be wondering, how long is the process? Some people told me two weeks, some people take a month. And the answer to that is it depends. Every single country has different processing times, and even within larger countries, there are different processing times according to the office. So if you want to find out what the processing time is for your country and for your Canadian consulate or high commission, you should refer to the Immigration Canada website, click on um, the processing times link on the main page, and then you'll put in the information for which country you're residing in, and it can tell you what those processing times are. Now, if you have not yet applied and your processing times indicate that it's going to be more than three weeks or four weeks, unfortunately, the university cannot speed up the process. The processing time is set by the members of the Canadian government, and so unfortunately, we cannot influence how fast or how slow that they do it. So we just encourage everyone to apply as soon as you possibly can. If you apply online, you can check your online Immigration Canada account to see what if there are any updates or to see if there are any messages from Immigration Canada according to your application. Now, with a study permit, when you apply online, you require certain basic documents. One would be the admission letter from the university. The other is going to be your passport. You're going to need to supply a photo. You're going to need to show proof of financial support, and you're going to need to demonstrate other documents according to your country or territory. Once you have submitted all those documents, if your application is processed and approved, you will receive a letter of approval. If you applied online, this letter of approval will be in your online account. You'll see a message saying your application to study Canada has been approved, and if you click on the link, you'll get the full letter. But if you applied using a visa application center, or you applied directly to the High Commission via mail, that is, you got all your documents in an envelope and you mailed it to them, then you will receive your letter of approval in the mail. This letter will have wording saying your application to study in Canada has been approved. It does not say, congratulations, this is your student visa. It does not say, congratulations, this is your study permit. It simply says your application to study in Canada has been approved. It's 
very important that you understand that this letter is not the study permit. It is simply a letter that allows you to receive the study permit when you actually arrive in Canada. So it's very, very important that when you receive this letter, you keep it in a safe place and carry it with you so that when you fly into the first Canadian airport, or if you're in the case where you may be an American citizen and you're driving across the border, when you reach the first border service um, agent, agent, when you cross the border, um, you'll be able to display them that letter. And with that letter, you'll be able to get your study permit. Now, if you have already applied and you received a refusal, one of the first things we ask that you do is first of all, just read your refusal letter. The refusal letter will indicate the reason as to why your application may not have been approved. It could be that you are missing a document. So for example, if you sent an application and you did not submit your faculty of graduate studies admissions or acceptance letter, then your application may have been refused. And so you'd have to reapply again by submitting that document. If your reason for refusal was a personal situation, for example, the immigration officer could say that you did not demonstrate that you had adequate financial support, then that's another reason why you would need to have to resubmit your application to show that you do have proper financial support. Now, I'm, not, I'm going to um, talk a little bit about financial support because I know that there's a lot of anxiety about this and what constitutes as financial support. So in order to study in Canada, you need to actually demonstrate that you have enough money to pay your tuition fees, to support yourself. And so by support yourself, I mean, show that you have enough money to live in Canada. So either pay rent um, or a mortgage or to buy groceries and of course your school supplies. When you receive your Faculty of Graduate Studies admission letter, on page two, I think page three of that letter, there is a summary of fees. Now, those fees also are indicated that it's subject to change because those are fees based on previous academic years, but that gives you an estimation of what the tuition fees are. So when the Government of Canada agents look at those um, letters and they're seeing if the university say this much is your tuition, you have to be able to demonstrate that you have something as close to that figure as possible. Estimations are fine. Now, if you're living in a country like India or China or Vietnam, one of the countries that have the study direct stream, you will see that it recommends that your proof of financial support can be any of the following. It could be a bank statement showing you have enough money in a bank account. It could be a letter of sponsorship, so if you're being sponsored by a third party, and third party includes your parents, it includes um, uh, an any agency, government agency, who's giving you funding to study, um, and it can include um, a private sponsorship from another company, then that letter is required to show proof of financial support. A common one that people think that they need to show is that they have paid their tuition and have a receipt from their university to show that they've paid their tuition fees. Now, uh, if you've contacted the housing student accounts, they may have responded to you and said that um, payments is actually expected closer to September when the fees are fully allocated onto your account. And so we don't necessarily encourage that you try to pay those fees that far in advance. However, if you do want to do so, I strongly encourage you to talk to the Dalhousie Student Accounts Office to see if that is even possible and hear what they have to say. I would also strongly recommend that if you do not pay the tuition fees in advance, it's perfectly fine to use the guaranteed investment certificate at a local Canadian bank. There are instructions about how to do so on the Immigration Canada website. A guaranteed investment certificate is one of the proof of financial support. So if your application was refused and it's because you couldn't show any of that financial support, then what you will need to do is see if you can change your situation, that is get more financial support to um, show that you actually meet the cost of your studies. If your situation can change accordingly, then you're welcome to reapply. However, if you do not have enough money or you cannot demonstrate that you have access to money to be able to support your degree, then if you reapply, chances are you could be refused again. 
Um, and so we would encourage you to you know, evaluate your situation. Maybe that might mean deferring if it's possible for you to defer in your degree program or even maybe waiting for another year sometimes. It depends on your personal situation. But unfortunately, the university, as in the Faculty of Graduate Studies, Dalhousie Student Accounts, and the Dalhousie International Center, cannot write you an appeal letter if the reason why your refusal was financial. It is your responsibility to be able to pay for your education. And so um, if you're unable to demonstrate that, unfortunately, the university cannot help with that regard. Now, some of you may be getting funding from your individual departments um, to help you with your studies, and it's fine to be able to show proof of that as well. If you are waiting on funding at this point, again, um, that the determination for that is if the specific departments, and some departments can probably only announce their funding a little bit later on. So unfortunately, you can't count on that to show as part of your um, study permit application, in which case we encourage you to look at other sources since your funding is not guaranteed. And I would not recommend waiting until late August, early September to see if your department will give you funding for the purpose of applying for a study permit application. Um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about reasons for refusal for your study permit and things that you could do to help you um, uh, improve that. So if the reason for refusal is travel history, um, this one is fairly simple to correct. You can simply write a letter explaining your travel history or lack of travel history. Sometimes you may have never um, traveled to other countries outside of your home country before. And it's perfectly all right to just say that. Um, so if you have traveled, then it's a matter of showing that you have proper immigration documents for all the countries you visited. So the way you can correct that is by showing scans of visas and airport stamps from previous passports you may have had. Um, if the reason for refusal was purpose of visit, um, then it's just a matter of proving that you really intend to study at Dalhousie. Now, if you have been able to register for some of your courses, you can present a confirmation of enrollment letter, which will be available on your Dow Online electronic system. So you would have been encouraged to set up a NetID and password to give you access to Dow Online where you can register for courses. If you look in your Dow Online web for students, there is a section where you can also download a confirmation of enrollment letter, and that proves that you have registered for your courses. So that can show the immigration officer that you really do intend to study at Dalhousie. Um, I already talked about the personal assets and financial status, proving you have enough money to cover the cost of your education and your living expenses. So again, very important. And sometimes reasons for refusal include family ties in Canada and in country of residence. So if that is the reason why they refuse, you'll be have to demonstrate that the family in your home is in your home country and you intend to return to them after you have completed your studies. This can be showing, um, uh, writing a letter, explaining that your parents or your spouse or other immediate family members are residing in your home country, um, that they have jobs in that country, and that you intend to return to your country after you have completed your studies. Um, and then finally, immigration status and country of residence. Now, some of you may be residing in countries that is not your country of citizenship. For example, your country of citizenship could be in India, but you are residing in Dubai because your family, so your parents, may be working in Dubai. In that case, you have to demonstrate that you do have residency status in Dubai. So for example, your resident card, um, in addition to showing that your passport is an Indian passport. So hopefully that makes sense. Maybe not many of you would be in that situation, but there are a couple of people who are. So it's just a matter of showing that you do have immigration status in whatever your country of residence is, if your country of residence is not also your country of citizenship. All right, so now I'm gonna move into what happens if your study permit has been approved. So I've already said that you would have received your study permit approval letter. You, if you are from a country that requires a visa, um, so that would be countries like India, China, most of the African countries, most of the countries in South America and the Caribbean, you would require a visa. A visa is an entry document. You 
usually when you apply for a study permit, the visa is automatically included in that application. So if your visa was also approved, they would have requested your passport and they would have sealed the visa inside your passport. Again, please remember this visa is not the study permit. You will receive the study permit when you land inside Canada. But in order for you to travel, as in go to the airport and get on the plane, you will definitely need the visa. So it will be sealed inside your passport. It will have an issue date and an expiry date and it will indicate your status is student. This visa allows you to actually check through the airport and get on the plane to enter Canada. When you are traveling, we recommend that you carry your Dalhousie um, acceptance or admission letter with you. We recommend that you definitely carry that letter of approval, also known as the point of entry letter. That's the letter that says your study permit was approved. Um, and you show those documents to the Canada Border Service agent when you enter Canada. Now, the agent is there just to ensure that you're entering Canada for the right reasons. So they will be asking you questions. They will be asking you what's your purpose of being in Canada? What's the name of your study program? How long will it take? Don't be too nervous and anxious. I know sometimes it can seem very, very, very nervous when a person in a uniform is asking you questions, but don't worry, they're not here to hurt you. They just want to make sure you're entering Canada to be a student. So be polite, answer their questions, inform them I'm a student who was admitted to Dalhousie University. I plan on studying a master of or a PhD of whatever your program is. My PhD program may take four years. My master's program may take one, two years, however long your program of study may be. Um, and then hopefully if you've answered your questions, they've reviewed your documents, they will issue you a study permit. And that's really the process. So the study permit will look like this. This is an example very quickly of what it was going to look like. And on the study permit, it will have your name, your date of birth. It will have a bunch of government numbers. Don't be too concerned about those. But what is important is that you make sure your name is spelled correctly and your date of birth is correct. We recommend that you do this before you leave the agent. So after they've approved you and they've stamped your passport and they give you that study permit, take a quick look at it and just make sure those things are spelled correctly. Because if they are not, this could lead to some trouble later on when you're applying for work permits, for example, if your study program requires you to do an internship or a co-op, this may complicate matters. Um, also, it's very important to make sure that Immigration Canada has your correct name and birth date on file. So definitely check and make sure, because if there's an issue right then and there, you can simply just ask the agent, point it out to the agent that um, my name was spelled incorrectly, and they'll hopefully take that permit, destroy it, and issue up a new one right away, so that you don't have to worry about it later on. We also recommend that you look at the bottom of the study permit and see if it has one of the following phrases on there. The phrases are, may work 20 hours per week off campus, or full-time during regular breaks, if meeting criteria outlined in section 186B of IRPR, under second statement, should read me accept employment on or off campus if meeting eligibility criteria as per R186F, V, or W. Must cease working if no longer meeting these criteria. These conditions are what allows you as international students to work part-time during your studies or full-time during a scheduled break. So as an international student, you do not require a separate work permit to work part-time or full-time during a scheduled break. The, your study permit should have these conditions on it and that will allow you to work. So if you are going to be a teaching assistant or a research assistant, it's very important that you have these conditions on your study permit. They should be automatically there, but just in case there is a glitch or a computer error and those conditions are not automatically included on your study permit, please inform the Canada Border Service agent to let them know that those conditions are not on your study permit. If you do not get a study permit with these conditions on it, 
once you arrive, if you want to be a teaching assistant or a research assistant, you won't be able to do that because you won't be able to get a social insurance number. So the work conditions on your study permit help you get a social insurance number. A social insurance number is a number that allows you to legally receive um, comp financial compensation for work you do in Canada. So most Canadians will have this, they get it automatically from birth, but as a foreign um, resident, you will need to apply for one, and in order to apply for one, you need to be able to show proof that you are legally allowed to work in Canada. So it's very, very important that you make sure study permit has those conditions when you enter. If for any reason your study permit does not have the conditions and the agents and you leave the agent without correcting your document or the agent is not able to correct your document, you will need to apply for another study permit. This is called an amended study permit. And this can take quite some time. It can take 30 days, it can take as long as 180 days. And during this time, you cannot legally work in Canada because you will not have a document that shows that you're legally allowed to work in Canada. So it's very, very important that you make sure that your study permit does have those work conditions on there. If for any reason they don't, please contact the Dalhousie International Center as soon as you arrive and so we can help you get started on the process of how to get the study permit with work conditions. But because of the wait time, we really, really encourage you that you try and get it at the airport because that will save you from either having to lose job opportunities into the first couple weeks in the semester, et cetera, et cetera. So please make sure that you can check those work conditions. Um, also, even if you don't have plans to be a teaching assistant or reaching a research assistant, a really nice job opportunity could come up um, that could align with your degree. And so many students end up needing to work, um, especially if they arrive and maybe something happens financially and they require a little bit more income. So working part-time can be helpful. And stressing part-time because your purpose of coming is to study and to study full-time. So we're definitely not recommending that you take up jobs that are 30 hours a week. In fact, it's not, you're not even legally allowed to work um, 30 hours a week during full-time studies. But they're just part-time jobs in different offices around the university that you could take advantage of. So that's what I'm referring to. Um, so many times we see students who have come through and they didn't get the work conditions. And I picked this quote from the student who, after helping them and trying to get them a study permit, the student said, I wish I had talked to the agent at the border because I need, really need money from a teaching assistant job and now I don't know what to do. So really try to avoid getting yourself into these situations from the start and just simply talk to the agent if there are no work conditions on your study permit. Um, so if you did not get that work conditions on your study permit, again, go to the International Center. We have instructions on how to get those work permit conditions on our website, but also we have international student advisors. I'm an advisor. My colleagues, Truly Mu and Teresa Nancy, are also advisors. Our job is to help you apply for study permits, visas, um, co-op internship work permits once you've arrived in Canada, so we'll be there to assist you. So you can refer to our website with instructions on how to meet with an advisor or with instructions on how to submit another application for a study permit so you can have your work conditions on there. Um, now, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what we do at the International Center. As I've already said, the International Student Advisors, our job is to answer your immigration questions. Some of you may have already contacted the International Center with regards to questions about applying for your study permit. Um, we are limited in the support that we can give you when you're outside the country because you're applying directly to your individual embassies or high commissions or consulates. And though they have specific instructions about those applications, so we do have to refer you to those instructions. However, once you arrive in Canada, um, if you need to update your study permit, get a new visa, if you're in an internship program like the Master of E-Commerce program and you're required, um, and you're required to do an internship as part of your study program, um, there's a work permit that you need to apply for. We can assist you with that, and that's what we're here for. You don't have to pay us 
to receive these services, uh, you simply just need to make an appointment with the International Student Advisor, bring in your passport and your other documents, and we can help you fill out the immigration forms and apply for these applications. Our job is also that you know what your regulations you need to follow as an international student. You are going to be a foreign resident in a foreign country, and there are certain laws that you need to be aware of. I'm going to stress this. When you come to a new country, there are regulations that you need to be mindful and aware of. It will not be the same as living in your country. Work is an example. When you're working in your country of citizenship, you don't require special documents to allow you to work. But now that you're in a foreign country, you do require special documents to legally allow you to work. So we know that there's a lot of information that you need to learn about. And we will talk to you about it at the International Student Orientation. So if you refer to our schedule on our website, uh, you can see that we have an immigration session just for graduate students. In that session, we will tell you about the laws and regulations that you need to follow in your new country. Um, and we go through, we will be there to answer your questions that you may have about this. Now, if you're not able to come to orientation, so your flight is a little bit later, um, or you're not able to come for any other reasons, we do require that you read the information on your own. We will um, send out some information from orientation via email that you can read up on, but I must, must stress that it's your responsibility to know the study permit rules and regulations. At least every year, we do have um, some students who say who may have broken a law, a Canadian law, um, and then they are have to face the consequences for that. And they tell us, well, we didn't know that we couldn't do this, or we didn't know that we weren't supposed to do this. Unfortunately, the Canadian government will say it is your responsibility to know. And so we know that the information can be very confusing, and there's a lot of inaccurate information online. Sometimes you may have had a friend who studied in Canada before you, and the laws have changed from when your friend was studying. So it's very, very important you get the direct and correct information from the best sources, and that's usually the Government of Canada website or international student advisors, imm certified immigration lawyers, or certified immigration consultants. Please, please make sure that those are your main sources of information, not information from blogs, not information from websites that are not affiliated with the government of Canada, and especially, especially students who may have studied before from your country. Regulations change every year. It's important that you know what your current regulations are. Um, if you break a law or if you do not complete a regulation, Unfortunately, international student advisors cannot help you in that situation. You have to face the repercussions and consequences of your actions. But there are many students who keep themselves informed. They contact the International Center if they have any questions about their study permits or visas. They've attended orientation and they're made aware of the situation. And those students are quite successful, have a great time studying at Dalhousie, get to take advantage of work opportunities whilst they're students, and if they do decide to remain in Canada following graduation, can also take advantage of proper work permits to help them do that. So you could be one of, definitely one of those students. Just make sure that you keep yourself properly informed of the study permit regulations and find the best sources of information to help you do so. Now, some of you may be traveling with family members, spouses, dependent children, or maybe even your parents. Um, if your family members are coming with you, they do require immigration documents themselves. Um, they will need visas to enter Canada if they're coming from countries that require visas. Um, if you're traveling with a spouse, your spouse is eligible for a spouse work permit, which they can request at the Canadian point of entry. So that could be the airport if you're flying in, or if you're driving across the Canada-US border, um, the nearest border services um, agency there. Um, so they will need to require, um, carry their passport with them. They will need to pay the associated fees for that work permit. I believe that's $255, um, but don't quote me on that because again, uh, the 
prices are set by the Canadian government, and so I'd refer you to the Government of Canada website um, to find out exactly what is the cost of a spouse work permit right now. If you're traveling with young children, I do actually recommend that you apply for study permits for your young children. This can make it easier for them to get access to schools in Canada. The Government of Canada website does say that if you are a minor that is you're attending um, you're less than 16 or you're attending elementary school or primary school or middle school you don't require a study permit and that's very true but i recommend um the students get one anyway because with the study permit as i said it gives them a lot more access to schools they won't have to pay as much fees for that and also if they need to extend your visas when they're in canada they will need a study permit to do so. If you only have a visitor visa, you cannot extend your study permit from within Canada. You have to leave Canada to extend your visa. So I do recommend that if you are traveling with young children, get them a study permit anyway. This just makes it so much easier once you're inside Canada to update all your documents as a family or to get access to schools or to not have to pay as many fees to certain school programs. Um, family, if you're traveling with parents, um, if your parents are coming with you and accompanying you um, and they don't intend to work, then they can just have a visitor visa. Um, and then once they get into the country, they can apply for a visitor permit that allows them to reside in Canada. A visitor permit does not allow them to work or study. So if your parents are interested in working or studying, they will require a work permit or a study permit. But if you're just coming to accompany you and they will just be living with you whilst you're in Canada, a visitor visa and a visitor permit is perfectly fine. There's information on all these family member documents on our International Center website. Now, with regards to access in the International Center, there are different ways you can do so. Um, so, to meet with an international student advisor directly, you will require an appointment. You can make an appointment either in person by walking into the International Center and requesting an appointment at our front desk, by calling our phone number, um, so the international code one before that, the number is 902 494 um, or by sending an email to international.center at thou.ca. Now, while you are outside the country, we definitely understand you booking appointments via email and phone, and you're very welcome to do so. If you need to talk with an advisor, you can schedule a phone appointment. If you provide us your number, we'll be able to call you and we can have a 30 minute phone appointment. Or you can ask your questions by email international.center.ca. Now, please be mindful once you actually do arrive in Canada. If you'd like to see an international student advisor, um, when you come in to see someone, you may not see someone right away if the appointment's already all filled. So when you make an appointment, you may have to come back two days later for your appointment um, because uh, the advisor's already filled with other appointments. So please be careful about expecting same-day service, and I'll probably say that other departments at Dalhousie, once you get here, will operate that way as well. There are many students here, um, and we try to serve everybody as best as we can, but if we're already all filled, we may not be able to get to your question in that moment, in which case, just have a little patience. Um, we will, hopefully, you'll be able to get an appointment maybe the next day or the day after that. Um, and remember that there's so much information on all the different Dalhousie Department websites where you could find the answer to your question right there on the website, um, or you can send an email to that person, they can get back to you there. So that's one thing about Access in the International Center that we would like you to keep in mind. And that's pretty much the end of the presentation in terms of what international students need to know about their study permits and visas. At this time, if you um, still require any information that I haven't talked about, um, we're going to do some questions. Absolutely. So I'm just going to stop sharing our screen. Um, actually, I'm going to put that back up to your contact information. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Might as well, yes. So go back. I think we might have just closed out. Uh... Paul, what are you seeing? Are you seeing the PowerPoint? Nope. Oh, just one moment, please. Thank you for your patience, everyone.
we're going to stop this share and start a new one. And so whilst we're getting that share up, um, I do again uh, want to talk about our emails. And so for um, international students or Dalhousie students in general, you've been asked to set up a Dalhousie email account. And your Dalhousie email account is the primary email source that most departments are going to use to send you information. So we do ask that you start checking your email uh, that has the email regularly. You can have your email forwarded to your preferred email if that's what you so choose. Um, and so you can find out the information that the university is sending you to help you prepare. I do have one question. I'm going to encourage everyone else who has questions to go to the question and answer box. Type us your questions. The first question is from Dinesh asking when orientation is scheduled for the Masters of Computer Science. So. There's actually a few orientations you can attend. Cool. Well, would you like to talk about international orientation? Yes. So the international orientation, it's a week-long program, but don't worry, it's not like you have to go to every single thing in that program. Um, it's just designed to be, um, if you need the service, um, it's there for you. So it starts Monday, uh, um, the last week in August. And um, on the first two days, we invite banks, we invite cell phone companies, we do campus tours, so you can get settled into the university and find out where things are. Um, then for the rest of the week, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, on Wednesday, we have the main international student orientation session, so that includes our immigration session and our information about getting involved and how to connect with other new students on campus. Following that on Thursday, you have the Faculty of Graduate Studies Orientation, which I strongly, strongly encourage you to attend because that gives you a great introduction to the Faculty of Graduate Studies. Um, you will see who the Dean is and you'll meet other representatives from the Faculty of Graduate Studies. Um, and uh, you'll get information that you need to know as a graduate student. And finally, for your individual different um, programs, like managing um, the computer science program, inter-networking program, et cetera, et cetera, they will email you with information on when their programs are. So I don't know the exact date for the MCS program, but if you contact the, um, your department directly, they should be able to give you a time and a date, and hopefully maybe a location. If it's not ready right now, you'll probably be getting information about that in in the coming weeks, but definitely attend your orientations because that's the best way you find the information that you're looking for. A uh, student who's attending all the orientations, so I know it sounds like a lot, but you may have to go to the international orientation, the faculty of graduate studies orientation, plus your department orientation. If you've attended all three, you could not be more prepared. They are all very helpful to help prepare you. Thanks, and thanks for talking about graduate studies orientation. Um, I have a question from uh, Anonymous saying hi due to a small mistake in the date of my visa application. I've been approved for a visa for one year Can I come there and extend my study permit and visa? The answer to that question is absolutely yes So once you arrive in Canada, you will um, you will be able to extend your study permit again come to the International Center you can meet with an international student advisor who will help you extend your application. You do have to pay another fee for that, and you do need to get some new documents to update that. But many students have had to update or extend their documents and have been successful at doing so. Okay, thanks. I have a question from Swarnima saying, as part of the Masters of Health Administration program, mm -hmm. I need to complete a four-month summer residency. Will I need a work permit for that? Uh, hi, Swarnima. Yes, you definitely will need a work permit for that. It's called a co-op internship work permit. When you arrive in Canada in your first semester, you will be encouraged to go to the International Center um, Immigration Workshops or meet with an international student advisor who will help you apply for the work permit that can help you um, with your four-month summer residency program. I do encourage you to apply in the fall semester, even though your um, summer residency is going to take place the following um, May to August period. And that's just to make sure that you get the work permit in advance to allow you to start applying for your different residency placements in advance. So definitely come to us in, uh, in September or maybe in October or November to apply for that permit. Perfect, thanks. And I have a question from Vanilla 
saying, hi, how do we go ahead with the visa if I have a conditional admission letter from LMC? Hi, Camila. Um, you can go ahead with your study permit and visa application with a conditional acceptance letter. However, um, because the letter says you are conditionally accepted, that could be for language reasons. Um, that could be for specific department reasons. You may need to demonstrate that you can address that. So if your letter conditionally accepts you for language reasons and say that you're required to do an English language placement, um, you need to show proof that you do intend to do that English language placement. So maybe that could be that you're going to be attending an ESL program when you get here, or you're currently attending an ESL program in your home country, or you are preparing to write a um, English language exam like the TOEFL or the IELTS. So we would encourage you to submit that along with the rest of your document, documents for that program. If your conditional acceptance was based on your department, I would definitely encourage you um, to write a letter just explaining that uh, you're waiting for full acceptance on your department for later. And I say that because when an immigration officer sees a conditional acceptance letter, they want to make sure that you're still coming to study. And so whatever it is that is preventing you from getting a full acceptance, they want to make sure that you're addressing that. So without really having those additional documents, an immigration officer may look at a conditional acceptance letter and say, hmm, they're not fully admitted. Let's wait until they're fully admitted um, before we approve the study permit application. So you do need to make sure that if you have documents showing that I am working on getting fully admitted, that helps improve your study permit application. But always remember it's the discretion of the immigration officer, okay? So even if some of those documents, they may still decide not fully admitted, um, we won't process the application. So it's always a risk to submit an application with a conditional acceptance letter, but some students have done it and they've been successful in the past. If I may add something, for graduate admission letters, every single letter includes a sentence saying, if you're currently enrolled in a, a university program, you must complete the program and submit your transcripts. That doesn't make it a conditional letter. That's a sentence that's in every single admission letter. We get lots of questions about that one. I'm sure you do too. Yeah, we do too. So thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> Our next question is, um, does our past visa rejection history from the U.S. affect the chances for a Canadian study permit? Uh, this is a very good question. So hello to whoever asked this question. Um, the answer to that question is it depends. So if you have been refused a U.S. visa, when you are some, when you are filling in the application form for the Canadian study permit and visa, it does ask if you've ever been refused um, admission to Canada or any other country. If you were refused a U.S. visa, I would say make sure you say so on the Canadian application form. And it does give you a description box where you can describe the circumstances of why you were refused. No, uh, the United States of America has refused a lot of people visas for different reasons in the past, as have other um, countries. That does not necessarily mean it will affect your Canadian study permit and visa application. However, if you were refused and you did not admit to the fact that you were refused before, then maybe, then you're, then you're omitting information. And when you sign the Canadian immigration form, you're saying all the information you provided is correct. So if you were refused, but you didn't say you were refused, then you provided false information on your application and a Canadian immigration official uh, will not be very happy with that. So if you are refused, don't worry. It's not, doesn't mean automatically mean that you will be refused a Canadian study permit. Just be honest about it and say that you were refused and you can explain why. The immigration, Canadian immigration officials look at that as well as a whole host of other reasons before they decide who gets a Canadian study permit or not. There have been plenty of students who have been refused visas to the United States, apply for Canadian study permits and visas, and their applications have been refused. It's just one component of the application. As I said before, things like your financial history matter, things like the, the submitted the correct documentation matters. So the Canadian immigration official looks at all of these things in addition to ever, if you've ever been refused before. And then they decide whether they'll approve your application or not. Perfect. Next question is from Cabin asking, will there be situations where the study permit document doesn't contain the work conditions? and brackets 20 hours, 
is also wondering why this would happen. Hi, Kevin. Um, so unfortunately, yes, there are situations where the study permit document doesn't contain the word conditions. Why this happens, it's usually just a computer glitch. When a study permit application is approved in a consulate or a high commission, sometimes um, the conditions of the approval doesn't make it into the system properly. That's the best way I can sort of explain it, or if there are reasons why the, the Canadian official who reviewed and approved that study permit application said that you did not meet the, requir the, the requirements of having work conditions on your study permit, then they would not put that in there. So in every application is different, and immigration officials look at each application individually. If you don't meet the requirements for working, um, they can choose not to put that on your study permit. But other times, sometimes it's a glitch, sometimes they may have just forgotten, sometimes it was just omitted. And so in those cases like that, we do say if you receive your study permit and there are no conditions, just ask the agent saying, I'm going to be an international student studying. I may have a TA ship. I may have a research assistant position. I will be required to work for that. And they may say, oh, sorry, we are going to get you a new one. Or they may say that according to the reasons of your approval of your study permit, um, you cannot get work conditions at this time. So everybody's case is different. If in the event that they said you don't meet the requirements for a work permit, come and talk to an international student advisor. We'll sit down and see what are the reasons why they say you don't meet the requirements for that. But in general, most students do. So the chances of you not getting those work conditions on your study permits are few and far between, but they do unfortunately come up and it's usually because it's just a glitch or maybe because the officer approved your study permit said that you don't meet the requirements for those work conditions. Our next question is, hi, since I have got a visa validity for one year when I reach Canada, what I so going through immigration, would I be offered the study permit for one year or at that time can I request like a two year one to match my offer letter? So on your study, okay, so first of all, when you say um, I have a visa validity for one year, I'm assuming that you're referring to the documents that was issued inside your passport. Now, the visa and the study permit don't always have the same expiry date. So I would refer you to the letter that said that your study permit application has been approved and see what the expiry date is on that letter. So that's number one. Um, so if you look at that letter and it shows that it is only um, expiring after one year, um, then the immigration official at the airport cannot issue you a two-year um, study permit because your approval letter has only approved you for one year. So the official at the airport can only issue you out the study permit according to whatever the study permit approval letter says. Um, and they unfortunately won't be able to change that. Um, so you would have to wait until you've entered the country, gone for immigration, arrived in Halifax, and then you can come to the international center to see if you can get that study permit. Um, extended. Now, it is important to also remember that they could have only given you a one-year study permit because you're in a one-year program. So I don't know the details of your individual application. That's why I'm recommending that you come to see an international student advisor. We can look at that and see if there is a reason why you only got one year. Um, but unfortunately, at the airport, when you just enter, you won't be able to just switch from a one-year to a two-year there. Thank you. Now I have a last question, which is, hi, I'm enrolled in the Master's of Applied Computer Science for fall 2019, and as part of my course, I have to do a co-op for at least four months. So this is a bit similar to one of the questions yeah. I already had, but this point is asking when the right time is to apply for the work permit. Um, apply in September as soon as your department is able to issue you a letter that confirms that you are part of your program and that you do require a work permit. Now, I can't quite remember if the Applied Computer Science already issues out those letters before arrival, but um, my, if memory serves, they definitely do it after students have arrived and actually enrolled. Um, they have to be very careful because sometimes students get admitted and then they never show up, so that's part of the reason why they 
they haven't been giving those letters before in advance. Um, so I would say in September, once you're officially here, you started taking your courses, you met with your um, supervisor and your graduate coordinator and all that has been approved, then you can get a letter from the department that confirms that you have to do that um, co-op and then we can use that letter to get that co-op board permit and so hopefully if you get that in September, you can get started on the application process for that in September and hopefully have your co-op board permit approved by the end of semester so that could be November or even December. Perfect. I'd love to give people one more moment to type any last questions they have. Are you yeah. interested in talking a little bit about getting from the airport to campus when people arrive? Yeah, I definitely will talk about that. So um, when you get to the airport, first of all, congratulations, you arrived safely. Hopefully you had a great flight and a great trip. Um, so when you enter, um, you're directed to the Canadian immigration um, agent who, as I said before, is going to take your letter, ask you a few questions, what's your purpose being in Canada, stamp your passport with an entry stamp, and then hopefully issue your study permit with your name and date of birth spelled correctly and with the proper work conditions on it. You will then be um, directed to pick up your baggage if you've immediately arrived in Halifax, or you may be directed to your connecting flight if you've gone from Toronto or Montreal or Vancouver, um, and then have to take a second flight into Halifax. Once you've arrived in Halifax, if you've arrived um, during the International Orientation Week, there will be an airport desk there to welcome you. Um, at that airport desk, you can meet with current university students um, who are there to help direct you to different transportation services. Um, the International Center is open to have airport pickup for international students. Um, we are working on the details of that. For now, we can definitely say it is going to be available during um, that orientation week period. We'll confirm the dates as soon as we can. But if you arrive between 8 a.m. and 2 a.m. the following morning, um, you should be able to get airport pickup. So please um, stay tuned to your email or the International Center website to find out if, how, and why you can apply for that. Now, if you arrived outside that window or you just simply prefer doing your own transportation, there are different ways. Uh, from the Halifax Airport, you can take a taxi. Um, you can go to the ground transportation desk at the airport and request a taxi there. They will direct you to that. The taxi um, is advantageous because it takes you directly to your accommodations. Um, However, you do have to pay for that. So the taxi is one of the most expensive ways to get from the Halifax airport to your accommodations. Um, the second way is to take a shuttle. So there is a shuttle bus that leaves at specific times. Um, you can get on, it is less costly than the taxi. However, the shuttle bus takes you to specific locations in the city of Halifax. So it may drip, drop you off at one of those locations and then you still have to find a way to get to your personal accommodations. Um, but it is cheaper. It does leave at certain times. Again, if you go to the ground transportation desk and you ask them what are the times or the schedule for the shuttle bus options, they can tell you what those specific times are. And if you go to the Halifax Airport website, it has a schedule of the different times. Um, the other option is to take the local transit bus. So Halifax has a public transportation bus system. Um, and it does also have scheduled times when it leaves the airport and goes to bus stations around the city of Halifax and bus stops around Halifax. So information for that is also again on the Halifax Airport website. However, I will say with the bus, especially I don't know how much luggage you're going to have, it can be a little bit difficult to manage. Um, and also, if you don't are familiar with the bus system in Halifax, you may not exactly know where to stop. So I would say do your research, use Google. Google is your friend, people. Use Google Maps. Um, I will give you an idea of where are the places that that bus stops at to see how close they are to your personal accommodations. And then you can gauge based on that whether I should take the bus option. It is the cheapest option. I believe it is $3.25 from the Halifax airport using the Halifax transit system. Um, but it's free for a reason because it's all goes stops on different bus routes, so it takes longer than the taxi, it takes longer than the shuttle, and it won't arrive at your personal accommodations. Uh, chances are, uh, so those are the different ways that you can get from Halifax Airport to the city on your personal accommodations. Thank you very much, and we do have one final question, 
This one is from someone who will be traveling to the U.S. at the end of the fall term, so around the 20th of December, to meet family. What would be the process for going to the U.S. for Canada when we have a study permit for Canada? So if you come from a country that requires a visa to enter the United States, you will require a U.S. visa. When you're in Canada, there is a U.S. consulate in Halifax, so many international students can apply for U.S. visas straight from Halifax. Um, the International Center can give you some general information about that process. However, unlike applying for a Canadian visa or study permit, international student advisors at the housing are not trained by the American government to advise on individual U.S. visa applications. So we can give you general information about where to go, the address of the consulate, we can give you a general overview of what the process is like. However, we can't sit with you and help you fill out the DS-160 application form that's required for these visas, and we can't specifically tell you to do this, this, and this, like we would for a Canadian visa or a study permit application. We are in contact with the um, Halifax Consulate. We actually do invite them to come to the university to give presentations and sessions for any international students who are interested in applying for US visitor visas, or if any international students want to go to a conference as part of their program, or even want to do a work placement in the United States, um, we do ask them, they come once a semester usually um, to provide information to students about that. Um, there's also information, of course, on their website about how to apply for the U.S. visitor visa. But if you are coming from a country that requires a visitor visa in the United States, you do need to apply for a U.S. visa. If you're saying that you'd like to go around December, I would recommend you apply for that U.S. visa perhaps in October, because in September you'd have just arrived to Canada, you need to settle in and they want to make sure that you are attending courses at Dalhousie University. Sometimes I will say um, they do ask for a transcript. So as a new student, your transcript will only have the courses that you're enrolled in, it wouldn't have grades at that time. Um, so be mindful of that. Um, so you may want to see if you can apply for a US visa in your current country right now if that is an option for you. But if you do come to Canada, yes, you can apply for it. We recommend applying in October, um, and we definitely recommend that you attend the information sessions when we invite the U.S. consulate to come and visit. We would send out information about the dates and times of this U.S. consulate information session um, in your Dalhousie email. Great. Well, Kamoba, thank you so much for being here today. Not at all. Thank you so much for having me. Um, this has been so much information and so helpful and such great questions that we've gotten answered. Thank you for doing all of this. Definitely. And so um, I wish everyone luck as they're waiting for their visas or um, if your visa is already approved and they're getting excited about coming. I wish you luck for your preparation. Please refer to your faculty graduate studies emails and the faculty graduate studies website for information on current students um, about anything that you'll be needing to bring with you. Please refer to the International Center emails and the International Center websites. Also, we will be launching our YouTube series very soon to give you even more information about helping students connect with each other and coming to Canada. So good luck, everybody, and uh, hopefully you guys will be arrived safe and sound in August slash September, and we look forward to having you at Dalhousie. Yes, thank you all for attending, and goodbye.